Optical visual illusions, they're, they're perhaps the easiest way to show that what we experience is really not a direct reflection of what's there. And these can range from very simple things like you, our brain encodes expectations that things under in shadow appear darker than they are. And so we can show you know, that, that that really changes how we experience shading and, and colour. And we take the context away and, and suddenly these, the colours all look different. Yeah, that wonderful famous image, which uh, for, for viewers I can, I can put on screen, for listeners will have to do with the explanation. It's sort of a, a generated image of a, of a sort of a cylinder yeah. producing a shadow on a checkerboard. And the, the light square in the shadow and the dark uh, square outside of the shadow look like different colours. But in fact... They are in the in the image the exact same shade, but because our brain sees that the one is under a shadow, or at least it appears to be in the image, it's the illusion. Our brain just makes it look darker, and it's it, you you describe this kind of illusion as what's the word you use like cognitively impenetrable or something. Yeah, that's right. Even when you know what's going on, you can't help you can't unsee it. You can't unsee it. So it, it's hardwired into into our perceptual system, and it's not. You know, it's not a failure of our perceptual system. You know, our eyes and brains were not intended to be light meters. They're, they're intended to figure out most likely what's actually going on. And so given that particular sensory information, what's, you know, we see the situation kind of accurately. Yes, there's a cylinder and a checkerboard, and that's the situation. So it kind of doesn't matter given our overall perceptual take that, there's this funny effect with colours going on. The other perhaps more interesting implication that has relevance for everyday lives too is that we will all see the same world slightly differently, even if we don't recognise that we do. And this too is a bit counterintuitive. If we start from the kind of naive realism view that we see things, hear things as they are, then of course we would just naturally expect, assume without thinking that somebody else sharing the same environment, we're in the same room here, is going to be experiencing things in exactly the same way because we all experience things as they are. And our, the character of our experience is like that too. You know, it really seems as though I'm, I'm seeing the world as it is in a way that's independent of my own brain and mind. But if that's not the case, as I think it's not the case, then just as we all have different bodies and skin color and height and so on we all have different brains so we're going to exhibit a kind of inner diversity just as much as we exhibit this this external diversity we're going to have a perceptual diversity and that is well that's something we're currently studying because a lot's known about it and i would say when the diversity gets sufficiently large that we slap a label on it and say you know this is autism or this is schizophrenia um but there's this whole middle range where I think most people just assume that we, sh we have the same subjective um, encounter with things. Sometimes it's, this is thrown into doubt, there was that social media meme of the dress, which half the world saw one way and half the world saw the other way. Yes, and you saw black and blue. I saw black and blue. I also saw and see black and blue and, and struggled to, to see white and gold. Um, Again, a simple Google search for anybody listening, but I'll put it up on screen. You'll probably remember this if, if you weren't living under a rock at the time. Uh, fascinating. I'm, you talk in the book about how people started doing experiments because, I mean, presumably it has something to do with the fact that this in this image, you don't know what color, what color the lights are. Right. So, you know, it, it's kind of, if you've ever taken a camera, um, most cameras will do this automatically, like the camera on your phone. But if you take a professional camera and you don't set the white balance... Yeah then, you know, the cameras that we have on us right now, if I've set them correctly, make us look sort of, you know, roughly the, the, the color that we actually are in the room. But if we were to move into a, into a room lit with yellow lights, we'd suddenly look really orange on the camera, even though to our eyes, we look the same because, you know, the camera doesn't have a brain that can make that, that projection, right? The camera is seeing just what it's presented with. It just sort of becomes orange because the lights change. But if we go into a separate room, we appear, everything still appears the same color, which I guess is further evidence that what we're seeing is in part what our brain is projecting. But in the case of the, the black and white dress, it's like, depending on how the white balance of the camera was set and depending on what color the lights were, it would sort of change how it appears on camera. So you talk about people like 
looking at the image and then running outside to change the lights to see if it will sort of change their perception. Um, I don't know if there are many cases of people who were able to sort of flip between the two. I think there are a few. I, 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 I've never been able to do it. I mean, I can see it differently if I change the background enough because yeah, you're, a, you're absolutely right. It's, it seems to be, so we have this basically biological automatic white balancing happening all the time. So if yeah. you take this, you know, I've got a piece of white paper in front of me here. It looks white. If I take it outside, it still looks white. But the light coming into my eyes would have changed massively because in, indoors it's a relatively orangey ambient light from the artificial lights we have. And outdoors, it's going to be relatively bluish. It's a sunny day. And our brains automatically compensate for that. And so we see white. And that's a useful thing for us to do. You know, you could make the argument that the camera, of course, it doesn't subjectively see anything, but it's more accurate in registering yeah. what's there. But that's not very useful. Imagine if our perceptual experiences just changed all the time, depending on whether the sun went behind a cloud or, or whether we walked from one room to another. That would yeah. be a very, very maladaptive way of encountering the world. So all that stuff is, is hidden from us. And the, the example of the dress showed that this particular process of like biological white balancing actually varies a little bit from person to person. And it, it just by happenstance, serendipity, found this sweet spot where some people's white balancing was such that they saw it one way and others such that they saw it another way. And the, the kind of vociferousness of the arguments that it sparked about, no, it's really, you know, it's got to be blue and black and I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, that for me was the interesting part of it because it really surfaced that we do bring to bear this kind of naive realism about our experiences. Mm. So that it's very hard for us to even concede or conceptualize that somebody else might experience the same thing, reality seen differently. Audio illusions are interesting too. I mean, it seems to me that those are easier to potentially switch between. Have you heard the uh, brainstorm yeah. green needle one? Yes. That's one of my favorites yes. because there's also the, the Yanni and Laurel mm -hmm. one. Um, that one people tend to say, you know, I sort of hear one or the other, but the... The reason I love the brainstorm green needle thing is because you can just hear one or the other, depending on what you're expecting. I'll, I'll play it for the people listening as well. So it's sort of this, it's from some kind of toy or something. Yeah. Um, I imagine it's actually saying brainstorm, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll play it. I'll, I'll, I'll splice it in here. So if you, if you listen to this audio, I'll play it sort of three times in a row. Um, and, and you listen for the word brainstorm. I'll play the sound now. You listen for the word brainstorm, you hear brainstorm. But if you listen to it again, but this time listen for the words green needle, I'll play it again. Then you hear the other one and you can sort of, you can sort of rewind that. I'll just play it one more time. Listen for whichever one you want and you'll hear it. And it, it's just whatever you're expecting to hear, you hear. What's remarkable about that, I think, is... It's not just like hearing brainstorm and then hearing something like shame's form, you mm. know, green needle. It's you like write the words down. They look entirely different. Like what, what phonetically or, you know, linguistically, um, do these things have in common? Green needle and brainstorm. I spent ages sat there trying to figure out like which syllable matches onto the other mm. one, you know, how, how it is that, how it is that you can hear one or the yeah. other, but you're quite right. It's like completely and utterly opposite. And I think that really does underline that the power of our expectations to constitute what we experience. It's not just some sort of like mild fussing around on the top. You know, it's really foundational because we can experience these two very different things purely by expecting to hear something. Yeah, I mean, in a particular th way. there can't really be an, an opposite of a, of a word, phonetically speaking. But if there were such thing as the opposite of brainstorm, it would probably be something like <laughs> green needle. Like you say, what we expect to hear changes what we actually in fact hear. And when we listen to something, we think, no, that's what it is because I can hear it. it my, my perception is being caused by the object. That must be what it is. But this demonstrates that our perceptions or our expectations shape how we view the world. And to me, I think this must have huge implications for worldview and for philosophy. If you expect to find in the world evidence everywhere abounding that God exists, then you'll find it.
Yeah. If if you if you expect the world to be a pessimistic place full of suffering and misery, then that's what you find. Similarly, I suppose if you have a an optimistic worldview uh, and you expect the world to actually, uh, you know, uh, feed that back to you, then then that's what you receive. So I mean, surely this can explain a lot about uh, people's political and religious dogmatism that you 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 meet somebody else and you just don't understand how they see the world that way. How can you how can you possibly think this is how the world works? It's because that's what we've been taught to expect, right? I think that's that's exactly right. And you mentioned earlier that we might bring to bear some kind of unrecognized arrogance in our ways of seeing because we don't recognize that they are dependent on our own particularities of our own minds, brains and and, and bodies. And so Part of the value, I think, of this work, part of the, the implications politically, philosophically, sociologically, is in deflating some of that arrogance and cultivating in its stead a kind of humility about our own individual perceptual takes on the world. And it's a, it's a humility that doesn't, it doesn't dive all the way down into total relativism and idealism. You know, we've talked about this already. There is a world and evolution has made damn sure that we see it in ways that for most of us, most of the time are useful. But they're not going to be fully accurate. They're not going to be completely identical. And cultivating that humility at the level of something that seems so natural as perception, and my hope is, is a bit of a hope, is that that can provide a bit of a platform for cultivating a parallel humility when it comes to, to our beliefs about things. If we recognize that we can literally see things, the same thing differently, then maybe that gives us a bit of pause for thought about the things we believe and, and how to at least begin to understand that other people can believe something that seems so contrary to our own ways of thinking. The full conversation that the clip you just watched was taken from is available via the link that's on your screen. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.